Jeff Pruitt, my wife, Kristen, and I co-lead a gospel community here at Element. And I am just really excited to get to explore God's Word with you this morning. Uh, if you're joining virtually with us, or uh, if you're here in the room, one of the easiest ways that you could follow along with us uh, is with the YouVersion Bible app. And so if you have your phone, you can actually open that app and click uh, More in the bottom right, and then Events, and Element Church will pop up by GPS, or you might have to enter our zip code, 93455, uh, to get all of the Bible verses and some notes and in, then some questions for reflection and discussion that go along with today's message. So hopefully you can figure that out. Um, if you're here in the room, would you go ahead and stand? We're going to read our main passage together. Acts 20, verses 36 to 38 says this, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Let's pray together. Lord, I just thank you for giving us your word, giving us this book that um, is timeless, that speaks into our lives and speaks into um, our circumstances, teaches us and sustains us and protects us, Lord. And I just pray that this morning you would use your word to uh, instruct us, to teach us what you want us to learn, to help us to live out what you want us to live out. And Lord, I pray you will soften our hearts to be receptive and that you would just help us to focus, to clear out the things that can distract and pull us away and help us to um, hear from you what you want um, to really take root in our hearts. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're here, go ahead and have a seat. Some of you may not know this, uh, but I spent my childhood in the Philippines. My parents were missionaries to a small tribe that was very isolated. We spent most of the time very alone in the jungles of the Philippines, um, it was mostly just our family in our bamboo hut. And uh, my brother and I were there, though, and we had a lot of fun in the jungle. Um, we'd swim in the river. We'd play with our G.I. Joes. My mom gave us machetes when we were three, so we chopped down her garden. Of course, that's what you should do. Um, but it was actually usually just the two of us. There weren't a lot of other kids around um, when we were growing up. And... When I moved back to America, I was about 10 years old. And as you might imagine, uh, I didn't have a lot in common with the rest of the kids here in America that I started to go to school with. And I struggled to figure out how to make good friendships. It actually took me many years uh, to learn how to make friends, and I actually feel like I'm still learning. Um, and it struck me as we got into this passage, something that kind of was surprising. It struck me that Paul, who is the main character of Acts, the part two that we've been following, Paul was actually really good at making friends. If you think about it, leading up to this point in our study of the book of Acts, we've seen Paul go all over the place. He's gone to multiple cultures, multiple cities, and multiple racial groups, and somehow, he managed to make friends and collect friends across all of these different places and all of these different groups. And they weren't just surface friends. These were lasting friendships. In fact, some of these friends, like Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, and Timothy and Titus, they actually left their lives and their homes to follow Paul on some of his dangerous missionary journeys. They had that kind of commitment to him. Paul just built these bridges and these friendships in a way that I think is inspiring. And I think there's a lot for me to learn and for us to learn from him as we look at our passage together in God's word. So if you have your Bible with you, can you turn to Acts chapter 20 or flip to it in your app if that's what you're using? Acts 20, the chapter starts with Paul launching out on a trip, leaving this city of Ephesus and headed towards the city of Jerusalem. But he chose to take the long way 
to get to Jerusalem. And he did this so that he could visit some of his friends and some of the churches that he had been to on some of his earlier missionary journeys. And I think Paul actually saw this as kind of a farewell tour. And he wanted to encourage his friends and strengthen them, but he also wanted to draw strength from these great friends before he faced the challenges that he knew were waiting for him in Jerusalem. Well, the trip starts, and we don't get a lot of insight into what happened in his, or what he said at least, in his first stop in the city of Troas. That starts in Acts 20, verse 7. And in the beginning, he gets there, and they have dinner together. And then they start talking, and Paul seems to launch into kind of a, a long farewell that it says lasted until at least midnight. And then all of a sudden, it was interrupted. In verse 9, we see what happened. It says, a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Oops. (laughs) So at first, I thought this guy fell asleep because Paul was preaching too long. And raise your hand if you've ever nodded off during a sermon. How many of you can actually keep your hand up if you've nodded off in your dad's sermon? (laughs) I think I probably can. Uh, We've probably all been there. And maybe that's what happened to this guy. But I think there might be another possibility. This reminded me of a few of my good friends. And when they come to visit or I go to visit them, we're so excited to catch up that our conversations will just go deep into the night and all of a sudden we'll look up and it's one or two in the morning and we're just still going. And there's this energy that because we just so enjoy talking and being together that drives us late into the night even if we get drowsy. And this night it seems to me like Paul was likely doing a lot of the talking but that same kind of energy was there and that excitement was present as these good friends caught up and pushed late into the night so late that this young man falls asleep and unfortunately dies. But then God miraculously gives Paul the power to raise this young man from from the dead, back to life. And guess what they do next? Just what you and I would do, right? After somebody comes back to life, they go back inside and they eat some more. And then they keep talking until morning. It's crazy. It doesn't even make sense to me. This miracle happens, they just eat and keep talking. Well, finally, Paul, at dawn, tears himself away and keeps going on this journey. He hasn't slept, but he keeps pushing forward. Luke tells us that Paul's plan was actually to sail past Ephesus on this trip. He had just spent three years there, and we saw in the beginning he just left there. So that probably made sense. But it seems like at the last minute, he changes his plans and decides he wants to see his friends, the leaders of the church there, one last time. So he asks them, he sends word to come and meet him on the way. And go ahead and find verse 18 so you can read with me what happens next. I want you to picture as I'm reading Paul pouring out his heart as, a, as he was convinced that this was the last time he'd ever see these friends and leaders So verse 18, I'm going to read this. It's long, so hang with me. So when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, which means listen, and now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all 
for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That's the halfway point of his little sermon here. <laughs> he keeps going. Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give then receive. And then when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he'd spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Well, if I didn't put you to sleep, hopefully you hung with me there. Uh, this is such a powerful scene. Um, and I hope that as I read through it, you were able to feel some of the emotion and the tenderness that comes through as Paul is saying these last words and this last goodbye to these good, good friends. Well, I think there's at least three sermons worth in this speech, um, but I'm going to stick to one. And what struck me most that I want to focus on is that hard goodbyes like this to great friends are actually a good thing. And that might sound kind of counterintuitive, um, but track with me here, right? If you have to say a hard goodbye to a great friend, that means that there was a great friendship that was built between you. It's really easy to say goodbye to a bad friend, right? I mean, you could even just ghost them. You don't care. But a really good friend is hard to say goodbye to because there is something great that you're leaving behind. And so I kind of want to unpack this together, and I want to look at four ways that Paul built these great friendships. I think there's some timeless lessons here that we can really benefit from and apply to our relationships today. Then we'll wrap up with one thing that Paul reveals here that turns a hard goodbye between great friends into a celebration. So let's jump back to verse 18. We'll hit the highlights together and walk through this. So the first thing that I see is that Paul built great friendships through shared time. And this comes out of verse 18. He says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Basically, Paul's at, Paul starts out saying, you were with me for all of this. You guys remember, right? And then in verse 20, he continues, you remember how I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public, and from house to house. And so that is a clue that right away we see Paul spent a lot of time with these friends. When he says he went house to house, in those days that would mean sharing meals together in the evenings. And he's implying that this happened night after night, possibly with some different friends, different nights, but it was clearly a huge part of his life. And as I was thinking about it, I'm sure Paul liked good food, and if he lived today, that would probably mean lots of tri-tip and garlic bread and grilled artichokes and peach cobbler and maybe some homemade ice cream. It's probably in the Bible somewhere. But more important than what we eat, I think, is that Paul knew that we need to eat together often to build friendships. And I think Paul is showing us and reminding us here that he made spending time with his friends, a priority. And the application for us is that we really have to put in the time to really build truly great friendships. Sharing time together takes effort, and it takes being intentional, and it requires that we make our friendships a priority in our lives. I was thinking about this. If you look back over the last couple weeks, 
and think about how you spent your time. What would your schedule show were your biggest priorities? Were you building meaning French, meaningful friendships as a priority? Or maybe were you spread too thin across too many people and maybe not building any depth? Uh, or maybe you were working too much and overcommitted to things that are fun but crowd out your friendships. I don't know, those happen to me often. We don't like to admit this, but our schedule reveals our priorities. And looking back over the last couple weeks can really help us to see what our actions are showing have become our true priorities. Well, if you want better friends or more friends, but your schedule says that your friends aren't a priority, then you'll have to change. You'll have to change your priorities and your schedule. I think there's, there's really no shortcut to this, and that's one of the things we see from Paul. But at the same time, just spending a lot of time with somebody doesn't magically create a great friendship. Um, there's a second aspect, let's look at this. The second thing we learn from Paul is that he built great friendships through shared truth. In verse 20, which we read, Paul said he taught them anything that would be profitable or helpful to them. And Paul really tried to help his friends understand and apply God's word. It wasn't always formal, but it was very intentional. And verse 21 starts to reveal what he was trying to help them to understand. Paul says that he was testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what did he share with them? What can we draw from this? He says he pointed them back to repentance, to changing their mind about who God really is. And he also pointed them to faith in Jesus as their redeemer, which is really just another way of saying he shared the good news of the gospel with them. He really wanted his friends to understand the gospel. And the gospel that Paul shared is simply this. It's the good news that Jesus came to pay for our sins so that we could be reunited to God and restored into an unbroken relationship with him. In order to make that happen, Jesus died on the cross to make the payment that our sin required, which was death. And then when Jesus rose from the dead three days later, he demonstrated that the payment he had made on our behalf was complete. When Jesus rose from the dead, the debt of our sin was paid in full and God's justice system was satisfied. And when we accept that great news that Jesus has rescued us from our sins in that way, it changes everything. It changed Paul. His whole life was changed, and he couldn't stop telling people the good news that Jesus had done the same thing for them. Well, before you think, you know, I'm not going to be a missionary like Paul, so maybe this doesn't apply to me, um, let's think about how does the shared truth of the gospel apply to building great friendships? I think it's this way. As we understand the gospel, and apply it, we begin to be changed. God starts to transform us into what he always intended for us to be before our sin messed things up. And one of the things that changes is that we begin to see people more as God sees them, as people who've been created by him to reflect his design and even his character in some ways. And we see them as having incredible value in God's eyes. And you can tell that this change happened to Paul because he tells us that he shared the gospel to both Jews and to Greeks in verse 21. Paul had grown to see both Jews and Greeks as equally loved by God and in need of Jesus. And this is significant. It may not connect right away, but it's significant to us because Jews and Greeks were racially and culturally divided at the time this was written. And yet, as the gospel sunk into Paul's heart, he had a compassion for both groups. And as those groups began to believe in Jesus, those racial barriers and traditions that separated them began to dissolve. They started to realize that they were now part of a larger family, which was bigger than their racial heritage or their history or their cultural upbringing. They were now part of the family of God, and that brought them together. 
And when I think about where we're at in our current climate, um, with our, our country and all that's going on, I think we need that same unity that only God brings through the gospel that heals our brokenness, changes the way we view things, and that is something we can hope for. I think political and social efforts will help in some ways, but only the power of God's love poured out through the truth of the gospel is going to bring the spiritual healing that our world needs right now. And I think that's because racial and relational brokenness is actually a spiritual problem first. And we need a spiritual solution, and a spiritual solution that we need is demonstrated by God through the gospel. When God changes us, he brings healing to our brokenness, and he changes how we view others. And then we begin to view them as God sees them, and that enables us to care for them, for people who are different than us, and also to build friendships with them that extend beyond the things that divide us. Well, as great as this is, Paul is actually, I think, knows that this is only the beginning. As we start to understand and apply the gospel, it not only changes how we see other people, it changes how we interact with them. And that takes us to our third point. Paul built great friendships through shared service. As God continued to transform Paul and the Ephesians, service became a defining part of their lives and their friendships. And I think that happened in at least two ways. First, they served each other. Paul taught and he mentored the Ephesians. He raised up these leaders. And then the Ephesians supported Paul and they fed him and they cared for his needs. They sacrificed for each other on both sides to serve one another. And then second, they served together on a mission to spread the gospel. For three years, Paul and these elders served the church there and the city together. And when it came time for Paul to go on his missionary journeys, the elders sent Paul with some of their best people, including Timothy. They sacrificed deeply for the mission of spreading the gospel together. And Paul knew how important it was to serve this way and, and how their relationships were strengthened by it. And so he encouraged them to keep it up in verse 28. Verse 28 said, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which is really to serve the church of God, for which he obtained with his own blood. Paul challenges them to keep serving one another to keep caring for the church. And to do that, they would also need to serve together to make sure that the gospel continued to spread. And I think in the same way, our friendships today need to include serving in order to be healthy and in order to grow. I think first, we also have to serve one another. And then second, we need to serve together on the mission of making sure that the gospel spreads. And each of those is going to require a degree of sacrifice. But that's okay, because a great friendship is built when there is sacrifice. It won't ever happen. You won't ever get a great friendship if either side is only focused on satisfying their needs. It just won't happen. But when we sacrifice with a friend, when we let go of our own interests and choose to serve someone else instead, God just brings this new depth to our friendship, and he makes it grow stronger. It is really amazing what happens when we serve one another and we serve together. But there's also one kind of side benefit that I want to just bring up quickly. Um, when our friendships are built this way on serving one another, there's this very common feeling called FOMO that disappears. If you've never heard of FOMO, it stands for fear of missing out. And I think it's actually a cute name for jealousy or envy. FOMO happens when we find out that a friend of ours got invited by another friend to a party, but we didn't get invited. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves upset or angry that we weren't included, and even cast blame that they didn't invite us. Or FOMO can happen when we see a friend get a great house or a new car or a really cool promotion. And we feel this envy rising up in our hearts because 
we want what they have. And unfortunately, jealousy and envy are sins that are self-destructive. So don't let the cute name of FOMO fool you. These sins um, are like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It just doesn't make any sense. But on the other hand, if you have a friendship that's committed to serving one another, instead of being afraid of missing out or having jealousy or envy when something goes well, you celebrate the things that go well for your friends and you're excited for them. And sometimes you even sacrifice your own wishes and desires to make it happen for them. A great friendship that's built on serving one another is stronger and better, but it also has no room for jealousy or envy. It just goes away. Well, there's one more aspect that I see in Paul here, the fourth one. Paul built great friendships through shared suffering. You might have thought I was going to end on a high note, but let's hit suffering. <laughs> How many of you enjoy suffering, right? No, no one is going to purposefully invite suffering into their lives, at least not someone sane, right? And yet here, Paul is reminding the Ephesians in this speech that they shared a lot of suffering with him. We even saw this in Aaron's sermon last week. They all together, they had to make it through this citywide riot in Ephesus that put all of their lives in danger. And somehow they made it, and they made it together. They faced severe opposition over and over again and hardships together. And that suffering bonded them together, brought them closer in a very special way. Well, many years ago, Kristen, my wife, and I went through a really difficult time, which I would call suffering. Um, we were looking forward to growing our family, but we got some bad news. And Kristen was rushed down to UCLA to actually hopefully save the baby we were expecting. Um, but she ended up having an emergency hysterectomy, which ended our 17-week pregnancy and our hopes of our family growing um, that way and that day. Um, and as you can imagine, we were devastated. Um, it was just brutal. But during that time, our family and several friends rallied around us, and they stepped into our suffering. They traveled the pain and the tears that we were going through. And I have to say, there is nothing that is like a friendship that has shared that kind of pain together. And so that's why I think this passage ends in a pile of tears. <laughs> you see Paul and his friends, it says they were all weeping because they knew deep suffering together and they had helped each other through those dark, dark moments. And I think, even though this isn't a super cheerful thought, great friendships have gone through suffering together. They have suffered, and that is part of what makes them great. And I think this is so applicable to us right now, because there's tons of suffering going on around us, right? People are losing their jobs, businesses are closing, we have loved ones dying or being ill. Um, there is a lot of suffering around us. And yet, we're alone in many cases, and it's difficult to navigate that. But maybe there's a way, right? Let me just ask you, who is suffering around you? Maybe you can find a way to encourage someone who is in your life who is suffering. Maybe you can come alongside them and just be present in that hard moment for them. And you don't have to have the perfect thing to say. Uh, in fact, it's probably better to say less when someone is suffering. And if you're the one on the other side who is suffering, let your friends in. Um, don't try to gut it out. Let them love you, even if they fumble it, which they probably will. Um, it doesn't really matter which side of suffering you're on. I've been on both sides. But your friendship will never be the same once you share suffering. But even sharing suffering isn't just about building your friendships. There's something bigger. Jesus actually told his disciples that demonstrating love like this to one another declares something to the whole world. Look at what Jesus said in John 13, 
verses 34 and 35. This may be familiar to you. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. So we have to love other people like Jesus has loved us. And then he says, by this, by your love, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when we serve and we sacrifice and we suffer together with our friends, when we love each other in this way, God is actually showing the world that there is a love between us that comes only from him. He proclaims who he is through our love for each other. And in times like today, when we do this and we build friendships that display this God-given love to each other, especially with people who are different from us, it shows the world that God's love reaches across cultural and racial and economic lines and all the others that divide us. And I think that's something we really need more of today. Well, that leads me to the last part of what really impressed me about this passage. Somehow, Paul seems to find comfort and joy in this hard goodbye. And I think it's because gospel-rooted goodbyes are not forever. Paul says this in Acts 20, verse 32, which is part of this speech. He says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul is saying here that he is commending or he's entrusting his good friends into God's hands. He's letting God take care of them. He's say, he can say this because he knows that God has promised an inheritance that includes living forever with Jesus and with all those who are sanctified. So that really means that death isn't the end of our friendships that share faith in Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 14 says that God even put the Holy Spirit inside of us as a guarantee so that we would know he's really going to follow through. He's going to carry out this promise. We will be raised again after death and get to live with Jesus for eternity. So even if we have to say goodbye to a really good friend in this life and we don't get to see each other um, before the other side, great friends who have trusted in Jesus will see us again and we'll get to see them because our goodbye will only last for a little while. It's kind of like pausing a great show on Netflix, knowing that there's like this whole nother season coming when you get back to it, except the next season's gonna be the best one ever, and we'll never run out of episodes. It'll just keep going. So that makes saying goodbye to a great friendship a little easier, and it might even be something that you could celebrate. Well, as we wrap up, I want to invite the band to go ahead and come up. I'm going to try to juggle all of these things. Uh, during the next few songs, we want to invite you to go ahead and take communion if you're here in the room or if you're at home and you want to take communion at home, that would be great. Um, this is a chance for us to uh, come together and remember what communion stands for the first and the most important part of communion is that this is where we remember and we celebrate what Jesus has done for us, right? We remember and celebrate that Jesus has died for our sins to restore us back to a right relationship with God. But there's also a community aspect to communion that maybe you haven't thought about before. Communion started as a meal between Jesus and his friends. They shared a meal at that first communion, and Jesus asked his friends to repeat this tradition as a reminder of what he was going to go do on the cross. And so as we celebrate communion as a community, we are remembering that first meal, that first friendship, and we're remembering what Jesus did. We are all together admitting that we have the same need to be saved from the penalty of our sins and we're all declaring together that we're depending on Jesus as the one who made that payment on the cross. So as you take communion, please use this time to kind of reflect on what God has done.
and how he draws us together as friends and as a community. And then let me leave you just one th last thought. Imagine what would happen to our community if each of our friendships grew to display the kind of love that God built between Paul and the Ephesians. What would happen if our love for one another was so compelling that people around us had to say, those people know Jesus? Isn't that how our friendships are supposed to look? May God help us to build friendships that honor him like that. Let me pray for us. Lord, I just thank you for being such a good, good God. Thank you for entering in to our brokenness and rescuing us and bringing us back to you. Thank you for declaring us friends with you because of what you've done to bridge the gap of our sin. God, and I just thank you too for this reminder from, from Paul and his life that we need to set our friendships as a priority, but that they declare your love and your grace most of all. I just pray you'll help us to grow into people who seek you first, who are intentional with our friends, who share the gospel with them, who serve together with them, and who enter into suffering together. Show us today just one step maybe that we could take this week to build a new friendship or maybe just deepen an existing one that would start to reflect your design and your desires better. And I just pray that everything that we do in our lives, including our friendships, would declare your glory and your love to the world around us and that we would be a people who, whenever others see us, they can't help but see that we know you and that we've been changed by you. Thank you for this morning, Lord, and just for your great, great love for us. Amen. <laughs>